Hello, friends. Welcome back to another episode of Theology in the Raw. I have on the show today my guest, Dr. Brian Brock. Uh, Dr. Brock holds a uh, personal chair in moral and practical theology from Aberdeen University. He's been teaching there for uh, since 2004. Brian came in as a professor right about, uh, I think, just after I came in as a student. So we crossed paths just briefly. And I remember hearing about his interest in a theology of disability. And since then, he's become one of the um, most renowned uh, scholars who uh, who write and speak on a theology of disability. He's the author of several books in this area: uh, "Wondrously Wounded," "Disability or Theology Disability and the Body of Christ." Um, he's also written "Christian Ethics in a Technological Age" and the more recently released popular level book "Disability." Subtitle is "Living into the Diversity in Living into the Diversity of Christ's Body." published by Baker. Um, we had a wonderful conversation talking about just kind of a, a, a 101 level discussion on what is a theology of disability. And already, I mean, I'm just kind of um, thinking and rethinking some uh, categories that I thought I had when it comes to thinking through uh, disability and creation and the fall and resurrection and all these theological categories. You're really going to enjoy this conversation. Uh, if you would like to support the show, you can go to patreon.com forward slash theology in the raw support the show for as little as five bucks a month, get access to premium content like once a month, uh, Patreon only blogs and podcasts and discussions. And you get an opportunity to ask me questions uh, that I might respond to on the Patreon only podcast or possibly the public theology in the raw podcast. Also, if you are wanting to engage the conversation about faith, sexuality, and gender, we've got a few events coming up. I'll be in Plano, Texas at the Revoice pre-conference October 7th uh, of this year. Also on October 20th and 21st here in Boise, we are doing an evening two and a half hour conversation, uh, an introduction to the LGBTQ conversation, and then an all day training event on October 21st, faith, the Faith, Sexuality and Gender Conference here in Boise, Idaho. All the information is on the events page at centerforfaith.com forward slash events. Go check it out. Okay. Without further ado, let's engage this really important and yet often neglected conversation about a theology of disability. Hello, friends. Welcome back to another episode of Theology in the Raw. I'm here with uh, Professor Dr. Brian Brock. Brian, thanks so much for being on the show. My pleasure. Yeah. So we go, um, I, as I said in the intro, we, we we go way back. We didn't really know each other very well, but we kind of um, uh, connected just a little bit when I was a student at Aberdeen, and, and, and Brian, you were uh, an, an incoming professor. And uh, I, I'll never forget hearing about your area of research is theology of disability. And at that time, man, I had no category for what that even meant. Um, and over the years, I still, you know, <laughs> I, I, I've only read bits and pieces, but I've, it's, this is an area that I've wanted to talk about on um, the podcast for a long time. So thanks so much for, for leading this in this conversation. Why, why don't you begin by telling us how you even got into this specific area of, of theology? Sure. Um, I first came across uh, disability when I was studying medical ethics, and um, I, I was in a sort of healthcare setting and uh, really learning the discourse of medical ethics. And I, disability popped up there as a um, as a theme that I just caught my attention because it seemed to unsettle the assumption that medical ethics is a discipline designed to help doctors sort of smooth over difficulties they have with patients who ask for odd things like Jehovah's Witnesses who don't want to do blood transfusions or, uh, um, you know, people who don't, who irrationally don't like um, uh, uh, transplants or something like that. Um, and disability just usefully raised question marks about the stance of that way of putting the question of what medical ethics is about. Uh, but I didn't really follow it up much. I just noted that it was there. And um, after I did my doctorate in London, um, my wife Stephanie and I moved to Germany where I did a postdoc. And um, our first son, Adam, was born there in 2003. And um, the, the first adventure he took us on was that he um, had a range of odd physical traits that they didn't really 
know what to make of. And we hadn't, my wife's a neonatal nurse and I, I already studied medical ethics. So we had pretty clear view about what we wanted from medical prenatal testing and um, what we needed it for. And we got what we thought we needed it for, which is, you know, to prepare for the birth. And that meant that we hadn't done uh, genetic testing in in utero. So when Adam was born, we didn't really know what his condition was, which turned out to be Down syndrome. And he was also pretty ill at the beginning um, uh, from an unrelated condition. Um, and he you know, was hospitalized um, and had a little bit of brain damage in, in, in his first week. So we had a, a kind of uh, welcome to parenthood with a, with a bang. Um, and uh, so that's when I started thinking about disability more in earnest. I first attempted to kind of write some of this up in a book that John Swinton and I did called Theology, Disability, and the New Genetics, Why Science Needs the Church, where mm. Stephanie and I just tried to tell the story of why it's probably not really accurate to think about genetic testing in, in utero as um, somehow firewalled off from the rest of the way medicine works, right? It has a lot of implications, and we found out the hard way that it unsettled doctors quite a lot, not that, that Adam hadn't been genetically tested, even though he was already there and presenting as a, mm. you know, as a patient with the illnesses of a patient, and they still were very unsettled by not having a genetic diagnosis. Is that... It, it... And I'm going to say all kinds of things that are probably wrong, way off base. I'm going to word things wrong. Is that is the assumption that if they found out in utero he had Down syndrome, that they would recommend an abortion? Is that why they well, were the, or... That's why there is an early cutoff for when they want to do uh, prenatal testing, but and it's related to the cutoff for legal termination. Um, so one of the things that I've reflected on as my career has developed is what it means that we live in a world where we, uh, as a matter of course, don't accept a child to care for it, prenatal care, after we've done prenatal screening. And that's infrastructurally the way every child in the Western world enters the world. Um, wow. we, and so, but there are various ways, and the sociology is really quite interesting around this, the various ways in which that's hidden from us in the practice of prenatal care, right? Like nobody wants to say, oh, well, if you had a disabled conception, you'd want to get rid of it, right? You don't right. want to say that out loud. So you have to present it in ways that are sanitized. And um, because we hadn't, because we knew what we were getting into, we didn't put ourselves in that position. And that meant we sort of missed the screening moment in the process and that really upset the medical care that followed followed from it yeah. and uh, i mean you wouldn't expect that but that's how it is the status quo is so dependent on thinking about getting the test first before you decide if this is a child worth caring for that it mm. um uh, it can't really handle the idea that one might think that's not the way to think about what it means to be a christian and a parent yeah I mean, how, how is that not eugenics or is that why th they have to sanitize the rhetoric around <laughs> possible termination, you know, um, if this child isn't the kind of child that fits the majority? I mean, yeah. that's just, you, you, depending well, on how you word it, it can get really eerie. But. We live in, uh, in the old, the way I put this in um, a later book where I'm reflecting on these themes is a uh, difference between a kind of prohibitive norm and a statistical norm. So the old eugenics, you know, classically, uh, with, you know, us English speakers think about the Nazis, even though we did it as much as everybody else is that you, you sort of decree, let's get rid of certain kinds of people. And you sort of force that on people by law, right? That's, that's, um, uh, kind of prohibitive version of law, but that's not the way law works today. Law works uh, by incentive and disincentive. So mm -hmm. um, you can choose to have a disabled child if you want to, but um, there's all kinds of subtle ways in which uh, it will be conveyed to you all along the road that you're basically burdening the rest of us with an economic cost that was unnecessary, right? So it's, a, it's an efficiency argument, which 
interestingly, if you look into the history of straight out Nazi eugenics, at the time, the argument was never, we got to get the breeding levels up. The argument was useless eaters, right? So we have our version of useless eater arguments, um, and they're very alive and well today. Um, it's, it's stronger in places like the UK, uh, uh, which have socialized medicine. Uh, it sort of raises the question of how um, uh, care costs are distributed in a different way. Um, but I, I think, you know, in capitalist free market systems like America, that it get, that gets done in a different way. So let's go back to, um, so you had a child diagnosed Down syndrome. Um, I, I imagine that was a huge step towards you saying, I really want to understand this on a theological level. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. Um, because, you know, one of the one of the conflicts that arose very early in his health care was, you know, Stephanie getting into arguments with the doctor when she would take him in for a cold and would be, get a sort of browbeating that he hadn't done genetic he hadn't had a genetic test, um, mm. which just seems like an odd dispute. I mean, what, how can you even have that kind of dispute, right? Like, let's handle the fact that the kid is like coughing and has snot coming out of his nose. That seems like an obvious thing for a doctor to care about. So why is it sort of producing such energy, uh, such anxiety around not having this other test, right? So at the back of this are questions about What's in a diagnosis? How does diagnosis work? What does diagnosis give you? These are all very live issues, for instance, around autism, um, right? Like the people feel like I don't fit in here and then they get the label autistic and that makes them feel differently about themselves and their place in the world. Um, so, so diagnosis is uh, constantly recurring in disability discussions. Um, because it's a it's a way of labeling people that mm -hmm. sets them apart in in you know in all kinds of ways and of course as Christians and theologians labeling and categorizing and, and separating people we've got a lot at stake in that discussion mm -hmm. so it it became clear to me as I was having these kind of experiences and because I was already trained in medical ethics and eventually in actually I realized studying medical ethics, I was going to have to do theology. It's going to have to do proper, full, full blooded theology, mm -hmm. because I knew I could sense that there were questions here that I just couldn't answer without knowing my own tradition better. Mm -hmm. So kind of the, one of the early things. So I came to Aberdeen and um, John Swinton is one of the really early figures in disability theology. And he was here. And I just said, you know, I, I really need to do some homework on this. Um, and this is obviously the place to do it. So the, he and I worked for some years just kicking these things around and he taught me what he knew. And um, we ended up editing together a volume called Disability in the Christian Tradition, a reader, which was just a, a survey mm -hmm. um, through, you know, through the canon of the Western tradition, you know, in the most yeah. traditional sense, what did Christian theologians say about disability? Yeah. 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 I remember when you guys were working on that. Um, uh, why, why don't we start or start? We've already started, but why, why don't we, can, can you, let's just step back and, and give us just a, a real basic overview of what is a theology of disability. Give us the kind of the, the nuts and bolts, the bones, the structure of it. And then I would love to get into maybe some of the, the different approaches within people who are, um, uh, disability theologians. I, I would imagine like any discipline, there's probably a range of different opinions and disagreements and would love to know kind of what are the, the main points of um, divergence within people who are uh, studying this, this area. I think the place to start with that um, question is to point out that disability theology lives in the space at the margins around what's considered mainstream theology. Um, so one of my core impulses as a, as a theologian is to say that ghettoization is hugely problematic. Um, mm. uh, it, it sort of positions center and periphery in a way that means race and feminist and mm -hmm. Hispanic and Asian theology is somehow kind of niche and 
then there's real theology, mainstream mm-hmm. theology, normal people theology. And I think that sort of normal uh, um, particular dichotomy is hugely corrosive to both sides of the equation. So it's a it's a type of dismemberment of the body of Christ. So there's a, um, there's a kind of general particular dichotomy that normally disability is one of those special conditions that some people have that somehow requires us to say a little something extra or different. And unfortunately, I think the way that dichotomy has played out, um, we're seeing a kind of flipping over of the the dominant discourse. It used to be that there was normal theology and these marginal niche discourses. And just in the last five or six or eight years, um, that quote unquote marginal discourses have become the dominant discourses and the, the old center is now mm-hmm. finding itself rootless and not knowing where to go. But this, the dichotomy between center and periphery is very yeah. much in place. It's just that the periphery is now where people think all the fun stuff's happening. I, that's it. That's super interesting. I, I'm curious how to avoid that. Like, as you're talking, I'm thinking rather than say a theology of disabilities, it just, it's just theology. Like what? what <laughs> um, yeah. And that's but, but, but how, but how do we, if someone says, yeah, but what kind of theology, do, like, how do you avoid, how do you avoid um, validating that kind of assumption that this is just on the fringe by the very language we use? And yet, how do you actually communicate specifically what you're doing? Or is that the tension that is always I mean, there? I think that's the whole shooting match. Mm. If you want to stop talking in us, them terms, mm. you have to, you have to have a different theology. That's mm. just all there is to it. And that's not easily done. Um, but if you want to say the church has to do better than saying you and me are uh, white, able-bodied guys and we're kind of normal people and then there's right. abnormal people, then you just have to face that question. right? right. Yeah. And, and of course, you will be fully aware that um, – there's going to be a lot of self-reflection involved on people who have formerly thought of themselves as, as the normal and baseline and standard, yeah. recognizing that maybe that whole construct didn't work. So I think the, the, the way that discipline is put together, a center and periphery model is, is related to and cognate with the, um, uh, the kind of what's called a normative bias, the, the idea that there's, there's kind of normal people and then there's people who are different yeah. who can't, can't do things, right? Disability is, for many disability activists, already a sign of the problem because there's like able people and there is disabled people, right? And that's mm-hmm. right in the label of pejorative mm-hmm. uh, sort of uh, grouping. And uh, they're entirely right to... Yeah. Raise the question of what that positioning disallows them from doing, and the way it uh, sort of downplays their role in what it means yeah. to be a Christian or what it means to do theology. What, do you have a better label than dis, disabled or dis, disability? Um, well, I think you you need to take a term like that apart to get anywhere. I mean, the, practically speaking, we can't avoid it. Um, and the reason we can't avoid it is it's the term we use to say some people deserve social support, political support. It's a political term that can be applied to some people that we say, as a society, we agree people with this condition can have a good parking space, let's say, or special health care. Um, but the fact that that label can be applied and taken away from any given physical condition points out that it's not, it cannot be an ontological designation, mm. right? And that's why in the church, we can say things like neither male nor female, slave nor free, mm. disabled nor abled. Mm. We can say that and mean it ontologically, we really are the same, but we need to find a way to say that, that recognizes, of course, particularity demands different social recognition. And, and to keep those two discourses running. I think one of the theological problems we have today in the church is that we don't have the native language anymore to say that we're the same ontologically, but we are clearly different 
practically and that we deserve different practical considerations, right? Like we, in practice, we recognize that yeah. a parent, ha, you know, gets privileges that a child doesn't get and a child deserves care that a parent doesn't get. And we don't think that that means the parent is more valuable or ontologically different than the child, but we tend to think think that way in terms of other social groupings. Um, and that's just a sort of loss of theological um, machinery and insight. Right. I, mean, I feel like we could spend this whole conversation just on language. I mean, that's how, how it always is, right? I mean, language is yeah. so crucial. And I, I mean, we, I mentioned offline, you know, I've been engaged in the LGBT conversation for a while now, and, and that's, you get the language down and the importance of language and why certain terms send certain signals and, and reveal certain presuppositions. And it's just that, that that's a, that's a huge part of the conversation. I imagine there's a ton of carry over here. Um, what are, I guess, what are some, um, what are some of the basic like theological questions that, and again, I'm I, uh, now now I'm nervous about the language but that, that that people who specialize in disability theology. What are the main theological questions, the basic ones? Like if you're in yeah. like first year uh, seminary 101, you're taking a class of disability theology. What are some of the main things we're wrestling with? I mean, I, I we we talked offline about like the fall. You know, if there's any kind of atypical feature in one's human experience, it's well, that's the fall. Is, is that actually a um? Is that just a popular level question, or is that actually a a, a more academic question that people wrestle with the role of the fall in atypical human experiences. Um, um, I mean, uh, already to put the question in those terms is a reflection of the center periphery yeah. framework, right? Because any human experience implicates all Christian doctrine. So it's, it's a sort of obvious instinct if you understand how the tradition works to recognize that, of course, disability has implications for every single doctrinal locus, right? It means something about the fall. It means something about redemption. It means something about resurrection. Um, it means something about how the body of Christ functions, right? So uh, that's part of what I learned going through the tradition for this, in preparation for this reader is that um, we moderns, have a drastically impoverished hmm. um, set of images about what counts as a human life worth discussing. First of all, I call that best case scenarios, right? Like for us, we really think of the human as um, the human being in this window when they're at the pinnacle of their powers, if they make it there. And everybody else is a kind of um, somehow downhill and a special case and um, not definitional of what we're talking about when we're talking about humans. Well, that's just not the case in much of the Christian tradition, which asks substantive questions about, say, for instance, uh, what, how, what age and weight we're going to be when we're resurrected, or yeah. uh, uh, you know, should somebody who's an epileptic get um, communion? Um, right? There's far broader sense that the human we're talking about is not the best case scenario. It's the full diversity of how human life runs. And that raises questions at every point in all kinds of, mm -hmm. in all kinds of angles. So that the fact that modern Christians, I think it's a reflex of our, especially modern Protestant embedding mm -hmm. in enlightenment rationality, that the only question we ask is essentially the theodicy question, right? How do we deal with the fact that some people have to live a life that frightens us. Mm -hmm. And our answer to that is, well, the fall. So there's like broken stuff and accidents in the world. And mm -hmm. I mean, and the way I put this in my kind of provocative version is, <laughs> who wants to um, get the hint when they come into church that their life is explained as, you know, Adam and Eve sinned and therefore the world's broken and that's why how you are the way you are. I mean, that's just not, that's not a useful thing to say pastorally or at any other level. Now we, that might be true and at, at some basic level, but the fact that our imaginations don't go any further than that is a, is a real mm. indictment. So, of, so you're not denying the, the, the theological credibility of that as a possible question to explore, but practically, yeah. ethically, pastorally, relationally. Yeah. That's just not 
typically a helpful way to go. Is that I would say if that's the only question you have to ask, the sin question you're not asking about is, mm. why do I think of myself as normal? Mm. And that's how in my kind of main academic wor work, Wondrously Wounded, Theology, Disability, and the Body of Christ, which is, I don't know, two years old, um, I, I really do go through all the doctrines. Okay. And I, I think that, you know, just, just take it up to a higher level. The Western imagination is focused on the, the material and the physical in a way that probably is uh, not defensible in the end. So um, we don't ask. We really think the question about the resurrection is, will I look different? Will I be the weight I wish I was? Will I get to eat as much as I want? Right. All very physical questions. And that has a long tradition from the beginning of Western theology. Yeah. When in fact, I think there's a good argument that I that that's just not an interesting co question compared to the question of what I'll be like when I am not a sinner, which mm. I only glimpse in the most momentary experiences and moments of sanctification. And if I don't have to sort of fight back against my sin, what is my personality going to be like? Right? That, why isn't that the question that we ask about sin? Yeah. Right. That would help us deal with the fact that we see people as substandard and disabled and, uh, you know, aberrant in, in thousands of ways. And that's part of what it means to be a sinner. And who we would be when, if we didn't have those sort of reflexes mm -hmm. seems to be much closer to the important theological question than yeah. you know, can you eat all the cookies you want when you're resurrected? <laughs> that's, wow, that's interesting. I got I to marinate on that for a little bit, but. <laughs> The show must go on like that. That, <laughs> no, that, that, that wow. Um, l let me give you. Um, let me let me let me in, <laughs> lay myself out and give you a, maybe a pattern of my thinking as I've reflected on this on a tiny minuscule level and, and see if. And I would love for you to pick apart my my logic if I'm kind of not even thinking right. But so I, I was born deaf in my left ear. Okay. Um, I uh, we don't know why. Um, my um back then so i was born in 76 and smoking wasn't um seen as it wasn't widespread knowledge that smoking was bad and and my mom was a smoker and so that there is there is a suggestion that you know her smoking caused a and i'll use the term birth de well birth defect let's uh cause this part of my head which in most people receive sound and in, in me it doesn't receive sound now if i go back and just reflect on design and human nature I'm going to say that this e my left ear was originally designed to hear. And so now it's not, it's not operating according to its design. Like, I don't think this is just like most people, this thing hears, but yours is just an appendage for looks like, no, th this in human nature, it seems like this little flap on the left side of my head was designed to capture sound. And it doesn't do that. It doesn't work the way, God, uh, I hesitated bringing God in, the, the way God originally designed human nature. And I'm hoping yeah. that in the resurrection, when I get a resurrected body that doesn't have, that, that will operate according to God's original design, even greater possibly, that this side of my head will receive sound. Um, therefore, it's not, wor it's not like it's, it doesn't work. Like there's something wrong with it. And I'd, I'd hate to use the word wrong. And it, I'm using it in the role light way here it's not like i'm at fault or whatever but like is it okay for me to hope that this will receive sound in the resurrection yeah because i mean it's and this is a tiny example and i i, I don't want to yeah. even want to map this on everybody else's experiences that are way more significant but mm -hmm. this is all i've known i don't know what surround sound sounds like i don't yeah. know what it's like to have earbuds in my ear go on a run and and have the bass and the guitar you know, interacting with each other. Like, I don't know what that, I would probably fall over and start throwing up if it did get healed here, you know? Um, so, so this is all I've known as a human experience. So my humanity does, will be slightly different in the, in the resurrection in a way that doesn't even correlate with my, a certain aspect of my life experience. Yeah. So I don't know, like, I don't even know where I'm going with that, but is that, yeah. is that like, I have no problem saying because of Genesis three onward, that like if I was living in a Genesis one and two world, this flap would operate according to its design. Is yeah. it 
right for me to think about it that way and is that like when i think of things like you know autism or down syndrome or other so-called disabilities that that w pattern of thinking would be similar or are those categorically different yeah i think that's a very common question uh and an important question and um i think it's it's not easy for me to give a straightforward answer because I think there's so much wrapped up in it that we could unspool that would lead us in different directions. So I'm just going to start to pull some of the threads there and yeah. come back to me if it doesn't make any sense. Um, the yeah. first thing is uh, um, there are different ways of describing the perfection of the human. Uh, and, and I think what you've talked about is very close to um, one of the default imaginations in the Western tradition, which is the platonic, right? So there's there's like one perfect human that has five fingers and five toes, and that that's the plan, right? God had that yeah. that model, and everybody is made on that model in their own particularity. Um, so you know, everybody looks different, and uh, everybody's slightly different height and not even twins are the same. And, um, I, I, as I was writing my chapter in the disability reader on Augustine, I, you can see this all in spades. So, you know, he's, he's trying to work out disability as a question of how much deviation from the perfect human do you have to have for it to matter theologically? So he'll say, it's like, uh, you know, having six fingers, that's not really much of a deviation. Um, and I think he would say, having one ear being deaf is not much, but, um, uh, you know, it's not relevant. Uh, but what he insisted on saying is God created everybody just like they are. And I think that's really important to say, because if you don't say that, then you intrinsically devalue the work of people who might have both of their ears that don't work as they would like them to. And, um, uh, those people have a whole lifetime of having to figure out how to communicate, joining a community of people who are deaf. And often they can become quite connected with, embedded in, part of that community. And um, that's a way we have to recognize theologically. And I think this is one of the first places where Christians lose track of where this is going. Mm. We don't recognize that a deaf community is an embodied embrace of the way God created mm. these people. Right? And they, they've taken that to heart, right? For me, this question really came, hit home hard when I was thinking about what should I expect when Adam is resurrected. And I realized if I'm going to go on that platonic model, then I have to say he lived his entire life beginning to end with no interruption masked by a kind of uh, accident of a fallen mm. genetic palate and that he will in essence be totally different than the person that lived in this world because every cell will be different than he than he actually was and that seems to me the type of sin that augustine is constantly pressing back against which is to uh disparage how god has made people as they are that's yeah, a few that's, pieces. There's more pieces to go, but that's no. Seemed... It's so good, and I, I, I didn't, I didn't realize Augustine, Augustine, um, had interacted with this. So, oh yeah, I mean a ton, uh, super interesting ones. I love to tell the story of a guy that he talks about in a sermon, um, uh, who he, uh, he said would, um, rain stones down on people when they gay when the gay crowd, uh. Uh, sort of um, used the Lord's name in vain and because they knew it would wind him up. So this guy was a Christian, obviously yeah. had learning impairments. And when people blasphemed, he would tell them to stop uh, to the point of violence. And the crowds thought that was really funny. Mm -hmm. And Augustine holds this up in a sermon to his congregation as an example of what it looks like to take the second commandment seriously. Um, wow. so he, he's constantly interacting like he, yeah. um, talks about Siamese twins, um, 
uh, he talks about, I mean, I think the, the city of God actually begins with a, a decent discussion of um, what were at the time called monstrous birth, deform, birth deformities, because back then people yeah. thought, is this a human or not? So right. uh, there's way more in the tradition than, I mean, modern Christians are basically impoverished by their assumption that we're the first ones to ever think about and ameliorate disability. And that, I mean, that's, you know, the kind of parochial arrogance of that shows up very quickly if you if you read beyond modern theology. So, so within people in, in your discipline, is there a debate about whether, for instance, somebody with Down syndrome will be resurrected without that condition? Is that kind of a lie? Yeah, it is, yeah. And uh, um, can you give us like the arguments for each side? Um, what people, what, like you kind of hinted at your sure. approach to that, but it maybe. Yeah. Nobody yeah. says you'll be made normal because that okay. is, that's absolutely repellent to people with disabilities um, who've mm. done, I would say, they've done the, the spiritual work on themselves coming to terms with who they are that most mm -hmm. christians haven't done right yeah. so they they don't want to be told oh uh you know you were just kind of gutting it out in this life and you're going to be made like you wish you were your whole life like everybody wants you to be in the end right so you just you can't say that yeah. and yeah. and that's a lesson that's a rebuke to contemporary christianity so if you don't say that what are you going to say um there's two main lines of of response at this point. One of them is takes the Irenaean line. Amos Young's famous for that. Um, uh, I, you know, we'll all be being slowly altered toward perfection as we travel infinitely into the life of the Godhead, right? So, you know, we're, none of us are ever standing still in the resurrection and we're kind of being rebuilt one piece at a time. Oh, okay. Perfection. That's one answer. The other answer, which I think is probably the dominant answer. Real, uh, real quick, Brian, I'm sorry yeah. to cut you off, but when you say yeah. perfection, what does that mean? Like the ideal six foot four chiseled, able-bodied, I mean, what, what is, what I is mean, perfection? That's the, <laughs> that's the um, uh, Achilles heel of that position. Oh, okay. Uh, it gets Defining out of that what perfection is? Saying, you can't, yeah. it's ap it gives a kind of apophatic final answer to that. How could we know what human perfection actually is? looks like okay. and it's something beyond you know everybody's going to be david hasselhoff or <laughs> pamela anderson right like it like we're <laughs> showing we're, your age bro <laughs> i know i know that's the ladies. sorry about that uh, i mean it's, it's, there's some gross projections uh that yeah. we uh, we always make about what human perfection looks like um uh and it, surely whatever it would mean to be progressively infinitely perfected would be to go beyond anything we can imagine as I, I and I, I don't want to get too hung up on this because you're in the middle of your thought but, but yeah perfection in those terms like western beauty to me that's not even a, it shouldn't even be entertained um yeah. but human bodies that were that are operating according to what seems like the original design humans are bipedal so it seems like both feet would be able to 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 move uh eyes are designed to see so two eyes working my left ear would be healed but whether you're tall short um thick thin whatever um it seems like help not just health in the western sense but like operating according to design Wouldn't, wouldn't that be a or is that a legitimate category um you can be not attractive according to western standards of beauty but that's not that's a kind of a categorically different even question you know um, uh it depends that... on i think unfortunately if you have these discussions in any detail they almost always end up with those sort of projection accounts surfacing oh. because it's actually very difficult for us to imagine what oh. resurrection life and embodiment is going to be like and so when push comes to shove after the first or second layer of okay tell me what it's going to be like it ends up okay. all my parts are going to work i'm going to look like i want to look right and and there's a that becomes pretty quickly transparently a projection okay of what we think of our our best selves basically uh so you know that the projection problem is all over 
the disability discourse, not least because disabled people know very well that the things that they actually suffer from are not what able-bodied people ascribe as their suffering. Okay. So, you know, Helen Keller, famously blind and deaf. Yeah. Everybody thinks of her. I mean, she, she rankled at the reality that she represented a blind charity as a, as the public figure for essentially her whole career. Cause that's all the public wanted her to talk about. Cause that's the thing that they thought huh. was most disabling from their perspective. But she said very explicitly, it's deafness. That was her greatest, uh, sort of limitation. Um, so that disabled people are, are very aware that what able-bodied people think about them is almost exclusively tied to what able-bodied people think they would experience if they had the condition that that the disabled person has right so someone with got a friend who was burned as a child has a kind of facial disfigurement from that and he's never he doesn't remember having any other face but so it, so for you know years he won't even think about it but everyone who runs into him will kind of have this inner recoil of a certain type. And so one of the phenomenological experiences of being disabled is trying to figure out why people are reacting to you the way they are. Hmm. And hence the centrality of the problem of projection wow. in disability discourse. Wow. So if normal people can't actually accept you for the way your body is, that, I think, helps you to see why hanging out with disabled people reveals how massive and powerful the trajectory is for able-bodied people to think of themselves as normal. And it's not just right. a kind of conceptual thing. It's a lived reality. I, I, I hear everything you're saying. I, part, of this, part of me that is turned off by that and and disturbed by that and yet part of me if i step back is also like but what else like it's almost like isn't that is like that's not shocking that people would be kind of that, that initial kind of like i don't know if that would ever change nor could we even require it and again the, the only thing i could compare it to is like you know i just got back from africa from from kenya and tanzania and like so i'm a you know white person walking around kenya and it's not like I don't when people are kind of like, you know, Mzungu, Mzungu, you know, whatever. They're like, look at you. They touch my hair, or touch my skin or like people are staring at me right and left. Like, I don't I'm not like, why are you staring at me? You know, like, yeah. <laughs> like, of course, I'm, I'm a minority and a majority. Like, I look different. I, I it's it's kind of shocking a little bit to, to even see me, especially in certain villages and stuff. So um, like when there is a majority experience, it's not. I know it's kind of this, this weird tension because at the on the one hand I'm like no I don't like it when people with a minority experience or minority whatever look or, or uh, situation have that kind of relational encounter over and over like I, I hate that but it's like well what is it unrealistic to expect anything different or I don't know am I even is that offensive? So, I mean it's, <laughs> it's not unrealistic that in the resurrected life that won't be the case and uh, okay. Right. So, yeah. of course, uh, walking around with a Downs kid, people look at him all the time. Yeah. Right? Like, and he's out of the ordinary. And that's, he's yeah. always the white guy in Africa. Right. So, okay. Yeah. Point one. And that maybe in there, maybe we can imagine as Christians a social order with, which is less obsessed with maybe let's make him look like everybody else. And, mm -hmm is more obsessed with why do we think that uh, being out of the ordinary is so unsettling? And I think if we can't handle that question, yeah. the way that I deal with this, um, I, I've, I've still, I've left off the other answer to the, to the, yeah, I know, question. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll I, get there. I um, wrote a popular book over the first part of lockdown um, uh, for Baker called Disability Living into the Diversity of the Body of Christ. And there I start out by talking about um, cutting my hand with a power saw, you know, typical embarrassing middle-aged, you know, <laughs> wood, wood pile 
accident. Um, but it was, it happened to be my uh, middle finger on my right hand. And so I, I reflected on that as the opener in the book, because as a writer, right oh, hand, yeah. my identity is tied up with the functionality of my right hand. And yeah. I realized after I cut my finger and now it's, you know, scarred and doesn't quite work the way it used to. I, I do have an aesthetic of yeah. a full hand versus a uh, kind of mm -hmm. disfigured and uncomfortable and unsightly hand. And so I used the, that injury and the whole sequence that, that unfolded after it to highlight how in most, you know, the most plain possible language that, um, if I can't accept my own body when it's not quite how I imagined it should be, what makes me think that I'm going to be able to accept this people in the social body who are not like I right. imagine That's we should good. be right? like, it, 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 yeah, that, Sorry. and that, that game is right. Like there is a spiritual work of coming to, to, to terms with being a bald guy or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, having a finger, uh, you know, I could have lost the finger very easily, um, or not being able to use a hand at all. There's spiritual work involved in saying, okay, this is, this is my body and this is yeah. who I am. And disabled people do that work from day one, or they live their life in unbelievable frustration. Uh, and, uh, and that does happen, right? There are people, they're all bald guys who go around with sort of plugs from the hair on the back of their head on their forehead and there's a kind of um huh. there's a fight against givenness that that displays that i think disabled people can help us all help to relieve us Absolutely. from and if we say yeah really come to church and there you're going to find out we're all you guys are all going to be like us yeah uh, that that's pushing away our own redemption well, this, you know, we're talking about broader society, and even the question I raise is more like a societal one. But if we turn it into ecclesiology, then that's where the it seems like the church should be the location, the social sphere, the new polis, where there's loads of people with disabilities running around leading, teaching us. There's people, of the, obviously, you know, people struggling with gender dysphoria, people attracted to the same sex, opposite sex, both sexes. There's yeah. tall people, short people fat people, Western, beautiful people and non you know, whatever, like, like if yeah. the church could actually embody the kind of society where these things aren't head turning or abnormal, there is no us and them. There's only a we. Um, and that's, so I, I, and we still have to get to your second, but your second approach to this question, but a, a good friend of mine here in Boise, he's a pastor. He has two adopted kids with, um, uh, down syndrome and, so, so the church is obviously, you know, that if the pastor has two Down syndrome kids, um, that's going to say something, right? And so there's actually several people who bring their kids with their uh, with some kind of disability there because, and they come to the church weeping because they say, every other ch church I go to, either ex explicitly or implicitly, my kids are a burden. Yeah. And they're weeping, saying, I don't know what it's like to experience a church where my kids are not a burden, where I don't get the looks, where if they make a weird noise or something, people don't kind of look around and give me the evil eye or whatever. I come here and I'm able to just come and worship and my kids are able to worship like that. That's um, that's the way it should be. And it's sho it's sho it's shocking and disturbing that, you know, this is like one church in a, in a decent sized city where people felt like they could actually come and, and have a part. Yeah, <laughs> actually, I, I'm totally on. That's exactly what I'm after. And yeah. I think it, it's theological work to narrate that as the default setting, because it, it, it is mm -hmm. practically speaking, not the default setting. So right. I think church is like the one you're describing or what I'm after. And it takes they're totally underserved in the theological academy to describe wow. why. Uh, that is actually how the Church of Body, the Church of Christ, should look, uh, right? And that, so that's what that's what I'm trying to do. And I think it takes the whole toolbox of Christian theology to do that, because most, again, uh, you know, if the logic of right belief is, you know, here's the creed, this is the true things we believe, um, 
Uh, here's how it applies to how we think about anthropology, for instance. Um, then it, it's very easy to end up with what I think is the uh, Bethany McKinney Fox. I was sort of looking at my shelf. Has written a good book. Um, whose title is slipping my mind at the moment, but um, she surveys churches and she uh, empirically substantiates that most pastors in most churches, evangelical churches, think of uh, their, they think of themselves as responsive to people with disability who come to church. And they also think of when somebody comes into church that sets up a responsibility for, for care. In other words, a demand. Right. So uh, the way that most pastors think about disability in church is as um, a cost. And what you describe is not understanding it that way. But I, I do. I'm using strong language here, but I do think it's a different theology to say, no, actually, we need difference. Uh, uh, right. We don't understand ourselves without difference. Right. That's one of the punchlines of the whole discussion we're having about what it means to be the normal human. Right. If you want to play the game of. There's one plan of what human looks like. There's one template. Then you have to ask, okay, well, does that mean all the people who died in utero, what what size are they going to come back? And um, what skin color are they going to be? And, um, you know, you have to kind of parse through all of the particularities that make up the diversity of the human body and the human, the, the human body as a, as a kind of global phenomenon. You have to somehow boil that down to the one plan of which there's greater or lesser divergence from it in the way that each of our lives get carried mm -hmm. out. Um, and that the resurrection is being topped up to perfect conformity to the plan. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, the problem, of course, with the um, platonic imagery is that then we'd all be identical uh, mm -hmm. because we would have all conformed to the perfect human. Whatever. So, okay, so you gave, well, a while back, the Amos Young kind of approach to in the yeah. resurrection will all be progressing towards the perfect. Um, what's the other kind of general approach that I think you said you take? You've, you've already, yeah. I mean, hit on so many parts of it, but maybe pull it all together yeah. in a tight. So yeah, sure. Thing. No, the, um, uh, thinkers like Candida Moss and there's a couple others um, emphasize the fact that Jesus isn't resurrected with a perfect body. He's resurrected with hmm the marks or the scars, funnily enough, the kind of discussion ends up turning on the fine point of do we, how do we translate that Greek term? Uh, is it marks? Is it wounds? Is it, you know, is it open wounds? Is it healed scars? That's a, I think a kind of a footnote to the more basic point that if we're going to be resurrected without any, um, divergence from perfection uh i mean jesus embodies resurrection that is not the erasure of all imperfection right a scar is by definition an imperfection whether it's a mark or an open wound mm -hmm. um uh and the way that i developed that idea is to say um of course we will be resurrected with all the bodily features that were part of the vocation that we that, that to to the the time in God's story that we were assigned. So, we we if we're created good, and therefore our particular bodily form and our mental form and our sensory palate are good in some respect, even if it's this uh, the fall has an impact of the causality of how that came to be. Nevertheless, we still affirm everyone is good simply because they exist and in the way they exist, then we can also in a subsequent move say in the resurrection, that goodness will not be erased as if it was irrelevant. Um, mm. So I don't have to think anymore. I don't have to anticipate in heaven. I'm going to get to meet an Adam who looks totally different and has a different personality than the Adam that I lived my whole, his whole life with. Mm. Um, I fully expect Adam to be recognizable in some respect because of the way his face looks. And I would not be surprised if um, his um, personality was also recognizable. Um, and weirdly, I think 
his personality might be closer to the way it is now than mine is. Mm. Um, mm. Wow. Uh, so anyway, that, mm. I, those are all ways of saying most Christian imaginations of the resurrection are just, just too, too simple. And mm. th- that wouldn't matter, right? Like theology, oversimplified theology doesn't really matter except as it plays out in the what what we how we treat those around us who mm-hmm. seem to to use Augustine's language diverge more from the norm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it seems really blurry. Like, what what does that even mean? That diverge one person's divergence from the norm is going to look different than somebody else, and somebody's going to draw that line in different places. Um, what about the the? Um, I've heard people taught in the. In the few minutes I spent in, on this topic prior to this conversation, you know, what, what about like things that are, cl- I would say, let's just say obvious and clear health issues. So for instance, I've got, um, I talked to a couple friends of mine who have an intersex condition. Um, one kind of would take more the view that you're articulating there, that, that my intersex condition is, is, is different than the pl- platonic ideal. Um, and yet this is, all I've known, it's who I am intrinsically, you know, very much in, in my embodied existence. I know nothing else. So who's to say that this is a problem? It's only a problem for other people, you know. But yeah. another friend of mine says, well, no, like my, because of my intersex condition, I'm on meds. I'm on all kinds of medication. I have other health issues that are related to this. Like, I hope that's kind of sinister to think that God single handedly did this and there was no outside kind of whatever evil force that had a role in this like that. Why would God make me like, like, this is not a good, I'm, I'm longing for um, a rescue from these things that are actually not fun at all. It's, it's part of suffering. So, um, and I don't, yeah. And I hear both and I'm like, wow, you know, is it, is it a difference? Is it a, a problem? Is it going to be fixed? And what does that even mean? And um, uh, so I, my question is, is it, legitimate to say if it is causing kind of serious suffering and it's a health issue that needs kind of medication to be addressed could that be evidence that in the resurrection that will no longer be or yeah probably thinking in much simplistic terms (laughs) yeah yeah don't don't take me um to be suggesting that uh healing is not part of resurrected life um what I am suggesting is that Christians, modern Christians especially, have a particularly horrific um, inability to distinguish what needs to be healed from what is good, uh, right? Like so. I, uh, again, I one of the ways I talk about this. My my popular book has uh, is every chapter is a kind of um, wrong belief about disability that each. Each um, chapter title is a is a wrong belief that I'm kind of refuting in the chapter, and one of them is Jesus heals everyone he meets. So we think about uh, Jesus healing in the way doctors heal, uh, and as essentially bringing the re- the resurrection. Meaning, if he ever ran across somebody with a disability, he he would of course have healed them because every disabled person wants to be healed, right? And that imagination is running so deeply. And there's mm. several issues with that, but it runs so deeply that if it's very common experience, and I hear about it on a regular basis, if people are in churches where healing happens, uh, especially charismatic type churches, even if they would go up and ask for healing for a condition like, you know, like a cold or cancer, they would be healed of their, what they'd be offered is healing of their disability. That, that's a recurrent theme. So yeah. that's the projection again, right? Like we all think, gosh, being in a wheelchair would be terrible. So that person coming down to be have hands laid on them in a healing service clearly wants to walk. Hmm. But we, we cannot typically imagine that that person would come down because they had a bladder infection and had been nagging them for a long time. Um, hmm. That's and, and that's the that's the kind of pro- projection stands in the way of our asking seriously what it means for pain and suffering to be taken away in the resurrection and not identity. Wow. 
Man, that's so good. Um, the, the projection, you keep coming back to projection. It seems like that that is a huge problem. The majority projecting their own kind of assumptions about what this person needs, what this person wants. Is that, I mean, that, that would be, it seems like a fundamental starting place where people need to kind of rethink some of these things. Assuming Absolutely. that everybody wants to be like this kind of ideal. Um, wow. So the way I get at that with my uh, sort of popular book is to try to, well, I'm using the injured finger story mm-hmm. to turn the question away from uh how do we think about disabled people toward how do we negotiate the disabled experience? How do I negotiate the disability mm-hmm. experience? Because of course, mm-hmm. if disability is in the most basic terms, the loss of ability, it's we're unlikely to get out of life without that, that experience. Um, and I think able, the able-bodied majority um, hasn't even begun to, to ask the self-critical questions about, am I prepared for that? So we can compare it to something like the memento mori tradition, you know, the meditation on the fact that I'm going to die and be judged as a as a, a monastic discipline of self-assessment. We can ask the same question about the about the kind of aging, the mm-hmm. the process of dying, and say, mm-hmm. am I really prepared to live out being an embodied particular creature? And uh, able-bodied people don't really have to ask that question until they get into a bind. And that's why a lot of times the disability discussion is so badly foreshortened by something like emergency cases. Um, Mm -hmm. There's no sustained reflection on the fact that we're all mortal, we're all limited, we're all particular, we all all fall short of some perfect ideal. Um, And that's, that's the apparatus that yields the center and periphery right disability is marginal cases for some people with special challenges whereas theology doesn't ask those questions at all that's that's how that distinction arises yeah, so good brian thanks so much for uh yeah i just have my mind unfortunately i got another podcast i gotta record because I'd, I'd love to sit here and just take notes and just reflect on this um <laughs> but the sh- another show must go on but t- yeah. tell us really quickly where people can find you and, and and say your um give us maybe two or three books that you've written that you would like to recommend to the audience o- obviously the popular level book what's the name of that one again and then give, give a couple others that you've written. yeah that one's called disability living into the diversity of christ's body it's in the pastoring for life series with baker um okay. uh academic press uh and i'd say that's where I'd suggest people start. Okay. That's a kind of popular, accessible book. And then, but I don't, to some people's consternation, I don't talk about my life with Adam there because it's, um, it's that's a difficult thing to do. Um, sure. For no other reason that one of the mantras of the disability theology discourse, for good reason, is nothing about us without us. So mm-hmm. as, a, um, as an abled person, I think it's it's very tricky to to speak for someone who doesn't speak. Adam's nonverbal, which doesn't mean he's non-communicative, but that means he'll never tell his own story in ways that you would be able to hear. So that question is is um, very close to the heartland of the real conceptual problems that that theology needs to deal with, and I think all theology needs to deal with, and I deal with that that those issues in wondrously wounded theology, disability and the body of Christ, which is uh, published by Baker University Press. Those are my two main texts. Um, if you just wanna do your homework, I definitely recommend Disability in the Christian Tradition, which goes through the whole, like I said, uh, uh, traditional canon, the main well-known figures, and there's a introductory text that explains primary text so you can read the primary text but also introductions from experts that okay. sort of tell you what you're going to read okay I'll put, I'll put all this in the show notes and then um uh are you on social media do you have your website i know you have your aberdeen website i just have my web- aberdeen website i'm i'm okay. uh, unfortunately just uh yeah. spattered about on google yeah are, are, where's your office at what what building is it in Ab- at, at the university uh I've, I've always ironically been in the exact same office um you know you know where john swinton is 
Yeah, yeah. The oh, one the main, hole, I'm uh... at the far end. I'm on the Cromwell Tower end of that hole. Oh, gosh. Yeah, so oh, I my gosh. Out the ground. Oh, man. <laughs> Walking down those cobblestone roads in the early cold morning. Oh, man, the memories. I, I was in a... <laughs> My office was in the old brewery. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Which is cool. It's an old building where the monks used to brew their beer back when they were, you know, um, they would go up, walk, walk up hosp- is it Hospital Road and Spittle. Medical- yeah, the Spittle. Yeah. The Spittle. Yeah. Yeah. And get medical training, come back, brew their beer. And that's where my office was. Nice. Well, uh, the, the seagulls have put on a, yeah, a pretty I hear them. <laughs> classic um, performance, which is the Aberdeen Songbird. Oh, man. Oh, yeah. Gosh. Oh, the memories. Well, thanks, Brian, for being on the show and uh, appreciate your time, your work. And uh, yeah, thanks for just challenging us and giving us so many great questions that probably half of us didn't even know we had. So uh, thanks for messing with our minds and our hearts. And uh, we'd love to see the church embody the vision that you've, you've given us, man. Seriously, that's 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 all, the ultimate question. So. Thanks for the great questions, Preston. Yeah. Thanks for inviting me on. All right. Take care.